Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to the University of San Francisco today. I would like to thank President Fitzgerald. I'd like to thank the Dean of the Business School, Elizabeth Davis. I would like to thank the Associate uh, Dean of the Business School, Barry Doyle, for making these great events possible. I would also like to thank LaShonda Small, Lisa Francetta, Jazz Johnson, Elizabeth Jacoby, Valerie Gonzalez, Susan Owens, Michelle Owens, Diane Pensiger, and many others for their help in organizing this event. Before we start, could I please ask you to turn off your cell phones uh, so we don't have some of those interesting uh, interruptions. Uh, the other thing is we're going to do a Q&A. There'll be one hour of a guest lecture and then we will pause and we're going to do a Q&A. Uh, if you have a question you would like to ask our guest speaker, please write it down on one of the index cards that is going to be passed around and uh, a student assistant will pick up those index cards and give them to me and we will uh, use those during the Q&A. Also, if you like to tweet, uh, you can tweet to hashtag USFSOM with all your comments during the event. I first learned about our guest speaker while I was playing a golf round at Lansdowne in Leesburg, Virginia. I really loved the co course, except for hole 17, and I later learned that our guest speaker had built that course. Our guest speaker began learning golf design from his father, Robert Jones Sr. Some people <laughs> estimate that our guest speaker has designed over 270 golf courses around the world. Robert believes that it's not the quantity but the quality. One of the innovations Robert has brought to golf is sustainable landscapes. He believes that working with nature is key to good golf design. Robert and his father are the only father and son team to have designed courses used in the US Open. His father designed Hazeltine and he designed Chambers Bay, site of last year's US Open. Our guest speaker is in a sense the Michelangelo of, of golf design. And when I say that, um, there are lessons you can learn as well. It takes hard work, it takes detail, and it takes getting it right till it's right. Not stopping just a little bit before it's right, going all the way until you get it right. As Robert would say, you got to make the putt. Our guest speaker earned his BA at Yale University and his MBA from Stanford. In fact, uh, Yale recently came out with a who's who of Yale University, and that's a pretty high feat to, to achieve, and he's on that list, along with George Bush, Meryl Streep, Jodie Foster, and a lot of other really well-known people. Today, Robert will talk about how he became a golf designer, the process of running a golf design business, including explaining how you make money. He will also tell us stories about his interactions with players like Tom Watson on Spanish Bay and the lessons he has learned from a lifetime in the golf design business. Robert has also written several books about golf and golf design. This is one that was translated into Chinese, and this is another one uh, that is well known about golf design, and he's kindly signed a copy, and it's going to go in the USF's business school library. I now would like to ask all of you to be as grateful as I am that Robert is here today. And I'm also hoping that one day Robert sneaks me into Augusta National. <laughs> Please give a warm welcome for Mr. Robert Trent Jones. Thank you, Ludwig. Thank you, President Fitzgerald. Glad to be with all of you. This is uh, not something I do very often, but I was uh, grateful to your inv invitation to come and meet with people. So I'm going to tr tr treat this as you suggested as not only the sport that I have been passionate about all my life, born into it and, and so on, but how we translated it into a, what we called a profession at that time and then later uh, the business aspects which I participated in. It's a wide ranging subject trying to reach each and every one of your uh, interests. And um, so how did I get started? Well, as I said, I was born into it. I, I was very fortunate to be born in Montclair, New Jersey in, a long time ago, in 1939. And um, when my dad uh, looked down at the cra cradle in which I was uh, lying, he put the rattle in my hand and said, Bobby, this is the grip. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a true story, according to my mother. In any event, uh, he was a great golf designer. 1939 was not a particularly good time for uh, the Depression was still uh, going on. 
He had started in the Depression. He'd been a caddy and then a golf professional from upstate New York, Rochester, New York, and had basically gotten a scholarship to Cornell University where he didn't work toward a degree. He took courses from the arts and the agricultural uh, colleges and the engineering colleges with the idea of becoming a golf course architect. Uh, the golf course architect con uh, name had been developed by uh, his predecessors in the United States, primarily by, uh, in the golden age of architecture, uh, primarily by uh, Alistair McKenzie and Tillinghast, and before that, C.B. McDonald. But the Depression had put a pretty big crimp on golf in general. And, uh, and so then World War II came, and, uh, and he was not able to work in that area either. But he was assigned to the Army Air Corps and worked uh, building grass airstrips because he knew agronomy as a defense system throughout the Northeast. But in that capacity, he was called to West Point in 1944, and um, they, the uh, director of athletics asked him to build a, uh, help them build, uh, lay out a nine-hole uh, nine golf course, which later became 18, and use the German POWs to build it because they had nothing to do. And that's how it started. The war ended, and I think they got eight holes done, and they had to stop and wait for Congress to appropriate the money to finish. <laughs> anyway, so that's what, that was the war years. But after the war, essentially, uh, this is a brief history of golf in the 20th century in the, in, the, in, 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 in the United States. After the war, Americans relaxed. They'd come home from the war. Uh, business was getting much better. A lot of people went back on the GI Bill to and, and finish their education. And, and people were looking for things to do. Some people took up individual sports like skiing and boating. But in our case, in our family, golf was uh, the sport of choice. Um, golf had been up through the 20s and, and, and when it was in the golden age, a kind of a rich man's game. Yet there were many, many public golf courses built in that same era. And uh, in the 50s when my dad practiced, when he became famous, it was kind of the democratization of the game. And I can talk more about that uh, later if you're interested. So that's how I got started. I went through public schools in Montclair, New Jersey. I uh, had a mother who was, uh, had her, she was Phi Beta Kappa at Wells College in English and philosophy. So I had two very strong um, role models to watch. I have a younger brother, Reese Jones, also a great architect in his own right. And we were trained essentially to excel. We were trained, we were given all the opportunities to uh, do all the things that kids do. My mother had me take music lessons. I played the clarinet, but to me that looked like about a five iron. <laughs> so that didn't last too long. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, but, she, but the keen interest in, in our family was if you're gonna do something, do it well. I played all the kids' sports. I broke a collarbone playing football. That didn't seem like a good thing to do. Uh, so I switched to soccer, which was actually harder. And I didn't realize that I had no padding at that time. But anyway, uh, I played baseball, but uh, probably struck out too many times. And finally, my dad said, why don't you play an, an individual sport in which you're on your own? It's a very entrepreneurial sport in that you take risk and re you gain reward. And you, you have only yourself to blame not any other teammates if you fail and you had the, and the success if you succeed is all your own. And that appealed to me. And I think that's the nature of the game. It's also, it's also an extraordinarily highly ethical game. Um, ethics is kind of a lost word in our, in our commerce of today and I'll come back to that. And et etiquette as well. Etiquette in French means ethics. And um, uh, so people are courteous to one another. They fight like crazy, they accept the vicissitudes of the, of the ball bouncing in odd places, either good or bad, and they um, are, are civil with each other, and, uh, for the most part. And, and professional golf, uh, if you'll notice, is contested for great sums of money, and yet at the end of the day, there's always a handshake. So that's the nature of the sport, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, about the profession now, which I practice and how, uh, as, as Professor Ludwig said how you make money in it. Actually, you don't. <laughs> you work hard and you uh, are, have to be passionate about what you do. You have to be a salesman uh, in some regard. Uh, but most of all, the golf, like any other sport, is highly competitive. So the business of golf design or the business related to golf is very competitive. Uh, I have many colleagues or friends. I've uh, been mentored by my own father and left him in 1974 uh, I had already worked on Silverado, which is one of my earlier projects, and began work in the Pacific um, uh, area, but under his tutelage. 
in, in the Philippines, in Luisita Tarlac, and in uh, Hawaii. I worked with him at Mauna Kea, but most importantly, I worked under his tutelage at Spyglass Hill. And he was at the height of his career, so I had a great mentor. And in this day of education, there's many different ways to, to obtain it here at the, your great university. You're obtaining it in a more traditional way. Uh, I had that experience at, as well, fortunately, and um, at Yale University where I played golf for Yale. And uh, we were lucky enough to uh, win the Eastern Champions one year. And I, I, I was, uh, loved that because we beat them at Princeton, but that was another, <laughs> another story. But at the same time, I had a very broad education. And Yale, uh, in liberal arts philosophy, was to teach leadership and self-reliance and not necessarily subject per se. Um, of course, that, the academic of it was very strict. And uh, things, are, things were very uh, interesting, but we had a lot of fun, too. Uh, I then came to Stanford University to do graduate work, not actually an MBA, but more in law, uh, because that was what you did in family businesses at that time. And I didn't, didn't intend to practice law, but I had interest in public service. I've been an intern for Senator Stuart Symington in Washington in 1958, and I was not chosen because of my academic credits. Uh, cre Credentials, I can assure I was chosen because I was in the golf team and he wanted to play golf with me on Saturday mornings. And that's a true story. <laughs> so those were different days. Um, so I think in terms of, of the business that we're going to talk about today, I'll, I'm going to show you some sort of how it works visually and try to work, work you through this. But that's some of the background. And then we'll, we'll uh, go into where we are t yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Uh, here we have. Uh, the business designing the world's greatest golf courses, I hope they are. There's some of them in any, in, in any event. Um, no, is that working? Which one is this? this one it's, it's the right one. You okay. have it right. Okay. So there's a photo of my dad and myself working on a project in Southern California called Beverly Hills Country Club and a model. We made scale models in those days. I, he asked me, uh, I told him, Dad, this, I'm, we're from New York area, New Jersey, and when I got to California, it looked like better weather to me, and as you're, if you're a golfer, that's part of it. And also, Northern California had some great golf courses, obviously Pebble Beach and others that are well known. And it was a very competitive uh, sporting atmosphere. And I told them, this is where the future is. The business is migrating this way. Americans are migrating this way. I think the state had about 20, 21 million people at that time. We're now to close to 40 million people in the state. And I said, you know, this state is going to develop. and Golf will be part of it, integrated with housing, and that turned out to be the Palm Springs model, and he agreed with that. So uh, he asked me to s set up an office, which meant I had to do everything, and, and I got married at that time, and my wife you know, typed for him and me, and we, we just, it was very, very much a family enterprise. Um, so the, uh, I've already mentioned to some degree how I got involved with golf design. This is at Spyglass Hill. There's a picture of my father. Myself and my brother at Spyglass, which was one of his great, great works. Uh, incidentally, Spyglass Hill was, was the business of it was uh, a leasehold given to the Northern California Golf Association, which was very progressive at that time, which is just ending this week, 50 years later. And they subscribed memberships for $2,500 a year, and dues were $50 a year for 50 years. And uh, that, was the, that is now the best rate in golf in the world until Thursday. At which point, the lease ends and it reverts to Pebble Beach Company. I'm sure the rates are going to be multiples of that, So, as they've already announced. Anyway, the point is that golf was not, there was not a lot of golf being built in, in the 60s. Uh, Vietnam War had not yet taken full th uh, attention of the, of the public, but there, we worked in places like Broadmoor in Colorado, Spyglass Hill. But it was moving west, uh, and we had the chance to work under his tutelage. And, Believe me, I did everything that you can imagine for him and with him, and I was very privileged to uh, learn at the master's knee. Um, what do I really do? Well, I mentioned working for an architect. I have been in charge of uh, my own works in the early days at, at Silverado and later at Princeville, where I've spent you know, uh, an incredible amount of time in the field and so on. Are you hearing me? Oh, I'm sorry. You want me to? Use this mic? Okay. Oh, I'm so that's much better. Now I've got two hands to work. This is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So, um, <laughs> so we, uh, basically, I'm a collaborative person by nature. I seek the best people I can to find to work with, and um, give. Uh, where if I'm in a leadership position, 
I often um, let them run with things and then I become editor-in-chief of some of the concepts. For example, we have uh, bulldozer operators who are wonderful uh, people. They're not, if they're strict and they're just building straight line roads, we don't want them. We want them to have creativity. We want them to emulate and mimic nature. So instead of a straight line, that, like a road builder, we want them to have convex, concave flow of line as we call it in nature. And if they have some idea, usually we choose the shapers because they love golf and they play golf, but they understand the nature of what it is the artists are shaping. You made the mention of Michelangelo, which is way over, overstated. But uh, the point is that uh, he sculpted out of the marble, and we sculpt out of the earth. And we sculpt um, the nature of our, the features based on the game itself. But we try to integrate the look of the place that if you're not a golfer, you, you don't think it's, you think it's nat a natural park and not something that uh, is artificial. That's our Jones style of uh, design. And we, we learned that a lot from Mackenzie and others from telling has that I mentioned. So, um, so I also think, and as far as the game is concerned, it's a game of high principle. And um, I like to use the Chinese proverb, which I learned working in China and in Asia at that time that I remain in negotiations and discussions with my owners, stiff as the pine on principle, but flexible as a willow on details. So that's how you actually get deals done. <laughs> um, and then that, that allows you to essentially uh, maintain the ethics and the interest in the game, which eventually is played upon, and, and the players will recognize its, its authenticity immediately, or, or lack of it. Um, we have a video here now. How, the, how we work. So we start with a, with a raw topographic map of the landscape. This is a very, very hilly place. And we lay out a golf course on it through straight lines uh, in a sequence called the root plan. And then we do a grading plan to show the, by civil engineering principles, how to move the earth. We then make a rendering to help the owner understand what we're doing, and so visually he can see where we're aiming to go. Now we get into the field, and we actually begin grading. This is in Korea. And uh, then we do extremely high uh, technical engineering, civil engineering, water always runs downhill. And uh, then we grass it. And this, these are the, that's the same hole. And that gives you a quick picture of the process of a, over a period of a couple of years. Um, and uh, that's, the actual, that's the actual product that we, we offer and, and, and sell um, in, in, in to, to, to the buyers uh, or investors. Um, so I'm a couple of case studies. Um, and I, I'm going to use these to give you some, I mean, like in any business, and any time you play golf, sometimes you win, sometimes you don't win, or you, you, but you never lose if you never give up. And golf is a game you must always, always keep playing. If any of you watched Adam Scott last Sunday and the week before, he had a quadruple bogey in Orlando and still won on the last day. He had two double bogeys and still won because he never gave up. And that's the nature of, of a champion in our sport, and it's the nature of how I do business. Um, and, and so the example is Spanish Bay. In, uh, at that particular time, I'd, we'd won a small competition uh, very intense one, Jack Nicholas, Fazio, and others were bidding for Poppy Hills and at Pebble Beach. Now, if you, when you have the opportunity at Pebble Beach, it would be like the Pope asking you to do a, a piece of art in the Vatican. And we like to say that uh, Cypress Point is the Sistine Chapel, so we can't, uh, it's already done. So we had to, we had to uh, be either, um, uh, well, Michelangelo had taken the best chapel, but you know, we, had, we had some pretty good land to work from. So we had Poppy Hills, and we were working in, in uh, Del Monte Forest. And that's, to, uh, to us, the, the highest, um, one of the highest commissions that you could attain. So the problem was that Sp uh, Spanish Bay, which is now named Spanish Bay, which was a degraded sand mine. And the ownership thought that they, shouldn't have, they should have a different architect. Well, Jack Nicholas is both a great player, the greatest player of our time, in my opinion, uh, still living. And he, uh, and a, as a very good friend, we're the same age. We've known each other and competed against each other in the national juniors and college golf. I played in, he played for Ohio State. I played for Yale. We played at first. We played. We met each other in Columbus, Georgia, in the national juniors. And incidentally, this is a side story, but 
He, uh, he wanted to be a baseball player because he said there was more money in it. <laughs> yeah, he eventually made the right decision. I think his father helped him on that. Um, in any event, the point is that he, he was being considered for Spanish Bay to, be, to, to distinguish us from uh, distinguish the fact we were doing Poppy Hills. So I uh, talked to Sandy Tatum, uh, who is a great, great person here. He's 95, a lawyer in this community, and former USJ president, and a great lover of the sport. And I said, do you think Tom Watson might in, be interested in joining with us in a, in a collaboration? And he had never designed a course, but we, we, knew, we all knew each other and played with each other because we're all Stanford people. And, um, and he uh, said, well, let me see. And he called him, he called me back, he said, Yes, but I know you, Bob. You're strong-willed, and he's strong-willed, and I'm going to have. To, I'm a lawyer, and I'm going to have to keep you guys you know, talking and not arguing. So um, he said, as long as I can be part of it. And I said, let's do it. So we made the presentation to Marvin Davis at that time, and Jack Nicholas had gone skiing. It was winter. And we worked very hard right through the Christmas time to do the layout, do the numbers, do the budgets, and on January 2nd presented it to Marvin Davis, and he liked our proposal a lot better, among other reasons. Uh, he liked it. I was then serving on the State Parks Commission, and the Coastal Commission was very difficult to get through, but they felt maybe I could persuade them that we weren't just building a golf course, we were restoring the sand dunes upon which it sat, and that's, that was precisely how we were able to eventually get it approved. The, re the reason I tell you this story in some detail is not about the success of it, because I've, I've had failures, and uh, projects that didn't work out, or I lost to another competitor, but this was a success story where you never give up had already been told that Jack Nicholas was going to do Spanish Bay. And I was at a ULI conference in Denver, and having played in the Jerry Ford tournament in um, Vail, I knew Marvin Davis, who was a very big man. And I w literally walked into his office uh, without an appointment and asked to see him. The secretary said, you can't do that. I said, well, I'm here. Just tell him I'm here, and we play golf together. He said, come on in, Bob. I said, do you want two bids? You're a businessman. Don't you want to compare bids? And he said, do it. So the point I'm making is you, when there's something worth going after, you can't give up. And it turned out to be a great success, we, we think. It also had an enormous number of environmental considerations and constraints, which was a change in our thinking. And to give Tom Watson full credit, he had me going all around with him in, 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 in the British Isles and looking at places you wouldn't necessarily know, like the fifth green at Formby that he liked. And I was building Spanish Bay, or Poppy Hills, with my team there, Don Knott, who was the designer, and uh, one of the designers and myself and our own shapers, and I was building a more traditional parkland course, and I had to shift my mind completely and be re-educated and be reinvented, and Tom Watson was my teacher. And he's five-time British Open champion, so I had a pretty good teach uh, uh, in, in thinking in the link style of, of uh, design. And it had all kinds of environmental constraints, which I can touch on later, but that's, that's where it all sort of started, where it became much more sustainable in my thinking and less parkland and more um, frugal and the use of land and, and, and resources like water in particular. So that's the story there. Um, Chambers Bay, I think you all, any of you who, uh, even if you're not a golfer, I hope you watch the Golf Channel or whoever's broadcasting our national championship and, and it was held last year at uh, Chambers Bay. It was a degraded mine. Um, it's owned by Pierce County. Therefore, it's funded, it was funded by a bond issue um, and it was supported by the uh, uh, proceeds from sewer, from a sewer bond act. So, you know, where, where there's sewer and water, there's always going to be a way to return the money to the bondholders. And, um, and uh, we had a compete, and we, 55, because it's a public project, 55 golf architects submitted uh, RFP to the RFP. They narrowed it to five. They interviewed the five. We were one of the five. And then they narrowed it to two. And um, we were fortunate. and. And there was another architect named John Harbottle who was local, who had a lot of support. And John Ladenberg, who's the elected county executive, um, we passed out in, in the final interview well, uh, t um, bag tags in which we said Chambers Creek, which was its name at that working name at that time, Chambers Creek, U.S. Open 2030. And that got his attention. So we said this course has the potential of hosting a national championship. And that's, uh, yet it's a tr completely public project b built by the people of uh, Pierce County, for the people of Pierce County. There's no housing related to it whatsoever. It's a restoration of a degraded sand mine and had many, many stories. Okay, so, and finally, Cordoval is a, is a different kind of chip. Um, 
and we live in the Silicon Valley uh, in Palo Alto, as you do with many here now with the, with the I mean, I think the whole Bay Area is in Silicon Valley. But uh, when I go to a cocktail party with, with the younger people, they're not talking about chip shots. They're talking about chips in their computers. <laughs> and so, and the silicon is uh, not a bunker sand. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's the uh, computer e era. So Port Cordoba was supported by those groups, and it will host our national women's USJ coming uh, the week of July 4th uh, through 11th and so on. So I urge you who want to see some of the greatest women champions of, of our time to come and watch that event. It's going to be right in your backyard. And why that's important, and I'll come back to this later, is it leads into the Rio Olympics for golf. We'll be back in the Olympic Games for the first time since 1904 because the, the world will be competing to play for their national teams. It won't be just, it'll be a championships within the championship. And that's the last ranking, that's the last tournament where the rankings count. So there'll be a lot going on. You'll we'll see a lot of Koreans, a lot of Chinese, Canadians, um, and uh, other nationals at that tournament. Okay, so the different, the point is different case studies, and I've given you reasons why they're all different from one another. I'll keep moving here. Um, I, I've already mentioned, I, I got ahead of myself here, but I mentioned the Spanish Bay in some detail. Chambers Bay, as I mentioned to you again, was a, a mine and uh, it was recrafted. We moved a million five hundred thousand cubic yards of sand and it was pure sand. They had mined it for the tailing, the tailing, the sand is the tailings, but they'd mined it for the stone to build the roads of Washington State it was a, and they left us diamond dust. We love sand for a lot of reasons. It drains and then can, you can grow fescue grasses on it, which is hard and fast. And uh, for those of you who watched the uh, tournament, that's, you can see it was turned, I called it gold. The, the players called it brown. Um, and uh, it was, it's, it's fescue grass, which is a grass that grows in the British Isles naturally. And uh, from Oregon, say from Portland to Vancouver, it's a maritime climate, one of the five maritime climates in the world, the British Isles being the most famous. And uh, therefore, this grass uh, thrives. And when it, goes, when it turns brown like that, it turns dormant. And it's as hard as that, that sound. When the ball comes down, it does, not make, it does not come down softly. It lands and rolls. So I will, I will say that the economic impact, according to eco economic uh, analysis by the USJ and Pierce County, was that it benefited the community to, to the amount of uh, 140 million US dollars uh, into the community on a public project owned by the community. And it, so it was a hugely uh, great, uh, had the multiplier effect in, in was working well in Pierce County and, and, and the uh, Seattle, Tacoma area. Um, Cordoval, as I, I just mentioned, different kind of chip. It, it's a mixed business model. S, it's owned by SAP's owner, Hasso Plattner, um, and he is a patron of the game. He also owns the Sharks. It's a private club, but it will host the Women's Open. There's a vineyard and a winery, and there's a Rosewood resort and housing. Completely different from Chambers Bay, which has no clubhouse. It has a little golf starting shop and a place to eat and walking trails through it for the public. So com these are really different economic models. And therefore, design uh, responses are, are according to the land and the model of the ownership. Uh, different geographic areas we've worked, ours is international business. I think um, I had the wanderlust uh, and I've worked th throughout the world. As I mentioned, I came to California from New Jersey and then kept going west, follow the sun. And we have done that. I worked throughout Asia in my youth, uh, took a plane once a month for, to Japan to build 25 courses in the 70s and, and early in the 80s when it was thriving as a golf uh, destination. And then we've done 85 projects throughout the, throughout the uh, Pacific Rim, which I include Hawaii as a part of. 10 in Hawaii, 10 in China, mainland China, uh, 25 in Japan, and, and throughout Austro-Asia. And um, the reason that that happened is that the decolonization of the regions in Indonesia after the year of living dangerously in the late 60s, uh, in Thailand, uh, which was never colonized, in Malaysia, which was Singapore, which was was happening, and golf was a, was, a, uh, was considered a sport of the kings and a, a sport of the business elite, and a sport of um, prestige, 
and they wanted good, good golf, and we had a brand, and I was willing to go. So, I mean, there it was, and it was a great opportunity. And they also were more interested, the Asian mentality was much more interested in um, your abilities, not necessarily your age. So I was young. Um, you guys all have brown hair. I had brown hair once. But, uh, the, uh, so you had to wait your turn if you're from the east coast of the United States, um, and as my brother did more than I. And but here, if you had some, if you had the reason, you know, if you were among them. So among other things, you had to learn the cultures of each of these places, which were really fun. I was in, I was basically being instructed by the Japanese uh, scroll masters on what they call the principle of, of harmony, where you replicate in the far ground and the near ground of uh, some silhouette. You might see a mountain over here, and I would make the bunker pattern over there. So I was applying what I learned from Japanese culture to my art, which had not been done before. But it was suitable to them, and they understood it immediately. They didn't have to explain it. They just felt it as they played through this landscape that was comfortable for them. So when in Rome, be a Roman. Um, and if you can at least speak like you're a Roman and, and follow their, their rules of culture and etiquette. Um, so we expanded on into uh, Asia, but probably a little short stop back to, the, to Europe. My first project was outside Geneva, where my father was very active, still active in that time in the 1980s. And then um, obviously constantly working in the United States and Canada, which is my home base and here in California even more. So I was on the road all the time. I built up a team of of really good young architects, some of whom have gone on to their own, do their own work, like uh, Kyle Phillips and Don Knott and Gary Lynn. And, and, and one, my partner to today who stayed with me, Bruce Charlton, is uh, you know, an, a, a great architect in his own right. And he's been with me now 32 years. And we're, we're, you know, we, we just uh, like hanging out with each other. Great shapers who follow us. And we sent them long distance. So we picked up people in Asia. Maybe they did good work in Asia. We would send them to Egypt. And as long as they were gypsies and they were willing to go, um, it was kind of fun. <clears throat> OK, now the business, since this is a business school program, the business school, the business of golf. Golf is a $70 billion market annually. And uh, golf course business, these are the derivatives in the golf course business derivatives. You see all the logos. You have the. Um, governing bodies, you have television media, which is very strong, the, PG, the various tours, particularly the PGA Tour of America and the European Tour. Um, you have sponsors such, of all kinds, from Cadillac to banks, North, uh, Northern Trust. Uh, you have you know, a variety of enterprises but, which are contributing to the $70 billion annual business. But the golf development is, n is not necessarily shown in all these logos. This is a, a, a produced by another, um, I don't remember who produced it right now, but maybe National Golf Foundation. But the, the point is that if we're, if we're about to build a golf course, it's, it's a much less uh, understood, but the, but the golf course itself is about an average of $20 million new, including bit small buildings, or at least buildings to house the equipment and, uh, and a modest clubhouse. Um, and that's what Chambers Bay costs. Uh, so it, but not including the value of the land itself. So the one thing about golf as a business is, unlike other businesses, you cannot outsource it. Your, your, your laborers are going to cut the grass where the golf course is. You can't get, you can't sort of virtually cut it from China or, or talk to those, um, uh, an operator in Delhi. It doesn't, you can't do it. So it, it's a very local and very specific, and it's very agricultural which is basic you know, and to all humankind. Um, so we, we, we talked about um, what international business and, and how it's changed. Asia has been a great booming, uh, merging area. Um, and what I learned, adapt to local conditions. Trust is earned. It's not given. Uh, it took me years at Moscow. That was, that was an adventure. And that, uh, that, one's a, that one's another story for another lecture. But, we started in 1974 at the invitation of Ar Armin Hammer, who was then chairman of Occidental Petroleum, who, had been, who was uh, a Russian. Uh, I think he was born there, but I can't remember. Anyway, he was there early in the, after Lenin took power. And he uh, was, kept his relationships there. And he invited, he, in the era of detente, which started around 1973, 74, under President Nixon and Kissinger, 
uh, he offered the Russians a golf course. Now, this is a quick sidebar, but you have to understand golf has always had a political um, connotation which, which was not always acceptable to those in authority. And under the Communist Party regime, golf was seen as a rich man's English game. So to, have a, to take on the risk of building a golf course in the then center of communism was extraordinarily high risk. And that's, a, that's another part of, I mean, you, when you calculate the risk, every once in a while you have to be a little mad and just go for it. So uh, that was why I took it on, because it was so improbable. My father and I went there. Um, I, at Yale, had learned how to sing some Russian drinking songs. That was extremely important <laughs> to bond. And, uh, and so on. But it took uh, many, many years to, to earn their trust, uh, five years just to find the land. And then uh, we had to get past their ideological censors. Marshal Sislov was their, was their um, I never met him, but he was the man who was rejecting golf uh, as a capitalist sport. And I ran into Alistair Cook, the great historian, and he said, Bobby, I think I can help you. Did you know both Karl Marx and Adam Smith played golf? I said, what? He said, yes, we know Karl Marx played golf because we have, uh, when he was re writing Das Kapital, his famous treatise, Communist Manifesto, in London, he would have a hit on Sunday afternoon with, the, with his fellow students because it was just a pastime. We're not sure about Adam Smith, but he was a Scot, so he must have been. So, so I took that, he then made a letter to, from America uh, on the BBC. I took the story and gave it to Ad Ambassador Vladimir Kuznetsov, who in turn gave it to the ideological censors, and they decreed that golf, after all, was not an English rich man sport, but rather a common shepherd's game in Scotland. And we got by. <laughs> anyway, um, relationships, um, uh, well, I like to say the, the, key are the key to a successful project. You have to spend time with your clients. You have to enjoy them, play golf with them, as I, I love to do anyway. And, uh, and people, you know, it's not, and maintain the relationship during the, the projects. Okay, um, what is the most difficult places to build? Uh, mainly in China. Uh, like the Soviet Union, it did not have um, a golf history, um, Mao Zedong and the Communist Party. There, was, there were a couple of golf courses in Shanghai, uh, took up the same ideological point of view and uh, banned golf during a long period of time. But I was invited by President Carter, my wife and I, to meet uh, Deng Xiaoping when he came at a state visit here, and we met him in Seattle. And uh, uh, President Carter always got me, my family mixed up with Bobby Jones, a famous golfer from Georgia, but we didn't correct him. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, um, this man would like to build a golf course. And he said, and I explained it to, to him, it was a small white ball. He said, oh, I like to play ping pong. I said, no, it's a, a little bit harder, <laughs> more tough, more, uh, more dense. And he said, why not? That was 1979. We first finally got a visa to go there in 1983. Um, we negotiated with Mayor Wan Do Han. Um, they took a long time on it. And finally, in, in 1989, literally two weeks after Tiananmen Square's uh, tragic uh, disaster, uh, we got a call from the mayor said, we will start now. And we had been talking for five years, so it was a political decision on their part to build the golf. That was the third golf course in all of mainland China. There are now 500 courses in mainland China, opened in 1991. All right, now why is this important? Well, I'm an, I'm also have a, in my family a long background with the Olympic movement. And my grandfather, Howard Lee Davis, ran in the first Olympics in 1896 on my mother's side. And so I also helped serve in a very minor capacity in the LA Olympics and the several Olympic Games. And I knew that if we couldn't get the two major countries who rejected golf to join, the IOC would never approve golf as an Olympic sport. And I was passionate about that long range dream. And so I worked hard at alleviating that with many, many other people. So that's the larger picture um, of, the, of the effort, uh, of the guiding light of why not go for it. Um, that was th some of the courses that uh, are different from one another. And historically, the traditional course was just a golf course. There, were no, there was no housing on it. We call it a core course. In the 50s, as I mentioned earlier, it was 
re uh, residential buildings were built in different cultures, and in Europe they would be separated from one another. In the United States, it became integrated essentially to sell housing, um, which is a business in and of itself, and a huge one, development related to golf and, and other uh, amenities. In, uh, the, in the 90s, um, they became inter interrelated, in, interlocked into master plans, and quantity rather than quality were more important to the developers. 2000s becomes viewed as an infrastructure, and, be, and there's a, re, a kind of a re renaissance of environmentalism, if you will, or, or, or sustainability, and natural golf was re, became more fashionable, which I agreed with uh, philosophically, and, and, and as I've demonstrated, we, we, did, we did it uh, that way. Uh, now, uh, the higher quality of golf, uh, in, a, in a way, returns. Um, and that, that's, I think, uh, golf and real estate, there it is, some of, the, some of the different kinds of real estates at far off places in the upper right is, uh, that's a, in, in uh, Greece, uh, in Pylos, uh, near in, on, on one of the main, the main island of Greece. Um, it's a touristic project. It, the invention of the jet plane, people would go long distances to, to go to resorts and golf was one of the amenities they would seek out, usually with others, in this case, the sea. Um, the, what I, the changes I've seen, I've mentioned from the emphasis on the quality of golf experience, caddies, links golf, creating a golf retreats, boutique. These are some of the future ideas that you'll see more of, such as at um, Bandon Dunes, uh, Nova Scotia, um, in far off ways, people would look f to go out to these, um, to, to have a golf holiday, who, those are who are golfers. About 10% of the nation Americans have played or have an interest in golf, and that's been consistent now for the last 25 years. A little bit off uh, from 2008 for economic reasons. So where are we working at the moment? Rio Hondo in Argentina, uh, that's one of our projects. Sand Valley is not one of our projects, nor is Cabot Cliffs, and Hogshead is one of our projects in Ireland. These are, just, these are really, you have to want to go there to play golf. This, you have to make, a, a, it's, a, it's a pilgrimage. I mean, it's, you know, if, if you want to, Think of it that way, a golf pilgrimage. Um, uh, Hogshead in Ireland is uh, site analysis, market studies, property recommendations, how the existing property was purchased, developed it, budgets, um, hotel construction to go with it. All is part of the discussion as a business. But yet, the passion of the owners is this is not a business. It's made by friends. Uh, for friends, for fun. That's their, that's their statement, mission statement. In the end, if, it's done, if all those things are the case, as in Bandon Dunes, it will make money. But actually, just owning a golf course is probably not by itself a money maker. And it certainly it's not going to make an, um, rates of return that Wall Street would like to see. Um, on the horizon, this is a course we're, we're just talking about yesterday. With, uh, in, for, we've been now working on it for 10 years. That is Mount Arbel, and, um, and it's, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, that is literally where the 23rd Psalm happened. That is the, the, that is the valley of the shadow of death. That is the mount, okay, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. So, um, the, and when I first went there, I could understand the Psalm for the first time. I mean, visually, the, the Israelis were living in the caves in the mountain, the Romans were on top of it, and they were fighting with each other, the valley of the shadow of death. Okay, but we're going to turn it into the horizon of the sunlight and, and, and beauty and life. It has had a very difficult beginning. It's been approved by the Israeli government 10 years ago, but there was some Hezbollah rockets, and the bunkers are now in, free. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we're, we, we're, they're, they, they seem to be ready to get started on it, and it looks like uh, the Rothschild family is going to finance it, the famous Rothschild family who helped found Israel. And they say, so we'll see. But uh, we, you have to be very patient. It took 20 years in Moscow, seven years in China, 10 years in Israel. This is not a, it's not a you, you must commit and then wait it out. And it doesn't always work out, but we'll, we're, this one is hopeful. Um, okay, so now we get into the economics of things and why people do things, uh, make investments, who are not necessarily golfers. There's a golf research group about 10 years ago for Business Week actually traced the increased value by tax um, uh, codes or tax uh, returns of the surrounding properties and golf courses and then ranked the architects who brought the most value. 
And this is a very sophisticated point, but if you're going to buy a piece, if you're going to invest $20 million on your own land uh, and, you, and you get social approvals from the community, uh, you will be under the microscope by your own community and your investors. So they, they, why is this important it's a, it, and why is modern metrics used to, to evaluate what people are actually doing? Um, in retrospect, it is very helpful to an investor, and we obviously were fortunate enough to come out well in that uh, survey. But if you think of it this way, a real estate developer says, um, if I choose Robert Trent Jones or Tiger Woods, who's going to sell my property? That's the way they think. Not to say what's the best golf course. I think that the, the, the next question is, who am I going to sell my property to? And most people will join our courses because they're such, uh, I mean, people who want to live on our course like, like it to look at it, even if they're not golfers, as a park that someone else is taking care of. But they also want to be in a community of like-minded people. And about, so in the case of, say, Tiger Woods, who just opened a course in Houston, we're told a lot of professional athletes, whom we know, like Charles Barkley, are investing. But in our courses, where women make most of the decisions whether they're going to live there or not. They want something that's user-friendly. So it isn't necessarily what's the hardest, the best, the most dramatic that, it, that actually is, creates the economic return. It's more complex than that. And you know, there's all kinds of different, really fine competitive people that are doing this, and the marketplace sort of decides on a very site-specific basis. <clears throat> um, what might the future hold? Well, we were, we, about 2000, I began to shift what I call a period my, in my career golf art, uh, creating fun, flexible courses that take less time to play. Returning to the 19th theory early of, of frugality and the use of land and its, and its resources, purchasing and rehabilitating distressed properties, and, and I think is, is where we're headed as in the competition for land itself. But also in the work, the art of it, um, I've been trying to create uh, lasting memories for people who are not necessarily golfers. Uh, by that I mean if you walk into San Francisco Golf Club, which I think is extremely beautiful, or Olympic, um, or Pebble Beach or Cypress Point, uh, you're going to just, even if you're not a golfer, you know you're in a Monet painting. So you just look in any direction. You sense beauty and, and beauty, the, the nature of beauty, uh, and being outdoors and breathing the fresh air and seeing a bird fly by and hearing a sea lion or whatever will restore you. It is, health, it, it is the nature of healing. It is the nature of health. And it, beauty is, is by far uh, what I've been trying to do in the last 10 years whether it's in the restoration of something that seemed to look ugly like Chambers Bay, or whether it's uh, taking a piece of land that is God-given with great uh, beauty and leaving it alone, and just kind of making 18 flags out there. So that's where I'm headed in my older age with my team, and my team is everything to me. They've been great, great supporters, and it's just hard work and fun work. Um, and people say, do you play golf? My answer is, does the chef eat? <laughs> <laughs> After we create this, we're going to enjoy it. Um, so now we're to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Uh, so we have some questions here. Uh, one of the questions is, who is your favorite golf designer other than your father and yourself? And your brother. <laughs> well, we have to eliminate my brother. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> we're so good at it. Sibling rivalry. Um, well, the, uh, I played golf competitively, and I grew up uh, in New Jersey. And the, but I got lessons from uh, Tommy Armour and Wingfoot, and so I played Wingfoot a great deal. Tillinghast was the designer. I'm a member of San Francisco Golf Club. Tillinghast is the designer, and there are two reasons I like to go there. Tillinghast is my favorite. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's the favorite golf course you designed, your father designed, and another golf architect designed? Well, my father uh, always said, when asked that question, he did, some say, 325 or more courses in his career. Uh, I wouldn't tell you who's my favorite child. I said, Dad, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, favorite course that, from my perspective, uh, that I enjoy playing, and, and by the way, as a golf designer, it's impossible to say which is the favorite course you might find interesting. That, you're the critics, you're the players. I just put the play out there as they do in Broadway, and you guys go and see it or interact with it. I, I, don't, I can't judge it from that point of view. It's too close to it. But from, from the point of view of the golf designer, 
the ones that are favorite to me are the ones that were the most difficult and challenging to overcome, not necessarily the ones that everybody loves. Um, it's, it's, it's experiential to me. So Moscow Country Club, uh, Spanish Bay, the Prince Course in Kauai, um, and the next one, I'm saying. <laughs> so I, I, I look forward to the challenges. In the case of my father, um, I think personally, I played my wife's son, Atlanta, and I played Peachtree, which he based with Bobby Jones as a collaborator on Augusta. And as the people may know, Augusta was designed originally by Alistair McKenzie, a great use of the land. It's a very hilly site, more down into it. Uh, yeah, it's the essence of spring. Uh, I say all these dogs would come out of the tall Georgia pines, and we see it on the television every, every, every Easter, basically. And it is Easter. Sense of it. Uh, but the, but the, he, the, the give and take of the game, the attack and defense, if Bobby Jones was the attacker, then my dad was the defender, and as the defenses were less than strong, we can lengthen the courses that they've done recently at Augusta. But in his case, he added water on the back nine, the ponds on 11, 16, and uh, the bunker, bunkering on 13 and across the creek is a new defense uh, in post World War II. So he was basing that experience, and I think that was so avant-garde at the time that I like to see when the, the, there's a paradigm shift in the, in the nature of your art, and it's fresh. And each tree in the Augusta National Park are my favorites in this world. Okay, and did, did we have another golf bar to Oh, they're all good. Okay, what do you think of Alistair McKenzie? You kind of said it. Yeah, I, I think Mark McKenzie, um, well, if you want to go deep with me on that, that's another story. Uh, <laughs> I think Mackenzie was a very dedicated doctor. He was a healer. He fought in the Boer War. He was a camouflage expert. We know the history of him. But he, he, if you if you walk backwards at Pasatempo on the course, you will not see a bunker. If you walk forward, they're right there in your face. They call them, we call them intimidating face bunkers. So he was an artist in the sense of, of crafting the features of the course. Now. This is a little known fact that my father played with McKenzie and, uh, in the 30s and before he passed away, in the early 30s. And, and, and McKenzie laid out the Lido course, um, or relay it out, uh, in Long Island contest. And um, my dad knew him. And um, in fact, McKenzie gave him his manuscript to get published, but nobody published in golf arcade books in, in the uh, Depression before he died. And, uh, I think McKenzie was not a good player. I mean, he was not a great player. And uh, while it's true that great players are not necessarily good architects, very rare that the two go together. It's also true that great artists are not necessarily great players. But to be truly great, you have to have some uh, essence of both. Um, and in that sense, I think McKenzie's sense of shot value was weaker than Tony Hass. Um, when I play a Tony Hass course, I know where to draw. I know where I know, I, I know as soon as I hit the ball, it's going in a bunker or it's not. With Kenzie, there's a much more of a um, uh, rather the green, as they call it, or an element of luck in, in, these, in the uh, way the ball ends up. So I, that's what I think about his work. Is, I mean, it was, we would have killed, as I explained. <laughs> we would have loved to have done uh, the work. Of, he had great pieces of land at the time when land was and he um, was a kind of a bald beyond, um, maybe not as much as Tony has, but he traveled and enjoyed life, and uh, he built courses in all over the world, so he was kind of an adventure, and I like that spirit. Okay, um, I, you mentioned Bobby Jones. I, I personally think he was the greatest player ever. Um, do you have any interesting stories to tell us about your father and Bobby Jones, playing or otherwise? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was one family story that uh, stuck with me. So they're both named Robert Jones, um, and that means we were Welsh people who couldn't sing. <laughs> and we were big cold, so we got to American families. And um, uh, so when he was working at Peachtree, Bobby Jones, of course, is, is was, and always will be the icon. He he was the highest man of highest ethics, a great competitor. Um, and, and, and highly respected, almost, um, you know, almost in a demigod kind of way by those in the sports world for his successes. And for the building Peachtree, which, is a, which, which was a, a course in 
Atlanta, outskirts of Atlanta, where General Sherman had actually um, held the, what is now the clubhouse and worked out when they burned on him, that's where he was. So uh, there's all this history going on there. And um, they, Bobby Jones drank bourbon and branch water. My dad didn't drink hardly anything, but he would have a drink with Bobby Jones if he wanted to have it. And he did. So they were having a drink and they were turning around where they were leaving this building. Uh, and he said, Bob, how are you? Ronald Charles or something. And they both turned, now it's their friend. And he said, no, Bob Jones. And they both continued. And Bobby <laughs> Jones said, so the boat did. Trent, or not Trent, he said, why did your name have to be the same as mine? And my dad, quick as a wink, said, there's going to be only one Bobby Jones. From now on, everybody will call me Trent. So that's the story that goes in deference to Bobby Jones. Um, what is your greatest lesson that you learned during your business career? Well, in terms of business, there's ups and downs, just as there is in the sport itself. But you got to play. You, know, if you, uh, you can't make a hit if you don't get up to that. And, and so you've got to um, suck it up if you fail. And I failed a few times, many times. And uh, you've got to go back and pull yourself together and, 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 and uh, go after the next project or go after the next game. And, um, and I think that's never give up. And, uh, and you go through the ups and downs emotionally. Um, and other parts of my life uh, had a serious tragedy. We lost a son, um, and uh, and I've also given back. To, I think the, uh, probably the greatest overall lesson is the nature of love. And the Greeks had four words for, it, for the nature of love: eros, which is erotic love; philia, which is Philadelphia brotherly love; um, agape, which is love of the gods and their, and their, and their beliefs. And um, charisma, which, and John Kennedy spoke of this, and I think you have to you have to serve love. What was your happiest moment in golf design, and the most generous compliment a player gave you? They don't give me much. <laughs> <laughs> they always tell me about, why, about their double bogeys. <laughs> the birdies are theirs, the bogeys are mine. <laughs> um, probably the most static moment I had, and, maybe it's, and I said it at the time, was when the United States Golf Association, my national association, whom I have the highest respect, um, and always have, um, announced the US Open on a course of my design. And if you put this in context, my brother did a lot of remodeling of courses, and other people have to play. They weren't playing new courses, since the last two new courses, the original courses, were done by my father, Bell Reeve, in 1965 in St. Louis, and Hazeltine. <coughs> In Minneapolis, which will host this year's Ryder Cup, and they've done no new courses in 45 years. So it had all kinds, and I was at at uh, his team with my father. He took enormous criticism, and, I, and uh, so from a purely family point of view, from the nature of the accolade or the uh, worthiness of the course, I was uh, actually it was too pale to describe that much. Did you play it as well? Did my father play it? No, no. Did you play uh, Chambers Bay, for example? Oh. As I said, it's a chef eat, I'm still playing for you. <laughs> yeah, and we revised it. There was a lot of work that went on subsequently to prepare it for the Amateur Championship in 2010. And then we took all the data the USJ had gathered, and with, Tom, and with um, uh, Mike Davis, who I think is an you know, he's a golf genius, I call him a chess player. Uh, we revised the course to prepare it for the Open. We changed three greens, we altered some uh, bunkering patterns, we added seven tees, and the, the, the nature of Chambers Bay is a complete, just as if Bobby, if, if Peachtree was a new paradigm, I believe Chambers Bay is a new paradigm from the point of view of the sport itself, in that there's only one tree, only one tree in the course, or in the specific northwest. I left it as an artistic reason, and, and also because uh, John Ladbrook told me where he would be in Peach, so we left the tree. But, um, and, but Mike Davis wanted to remove it because in the pure nature of Lynx courses, there are no trees. Um, it's, it's open to the elements. And Win. Uh, there, there are no trees that come into play, and there are no water hazards. So what's the defense? The defense is the ground itself. So it's very wide, very long, and very hard. So it's not where the ball lands, it's where the ball runs out. You have to learn to think. And so we made what I call the alpha and omega design. The tees are uneven, so you have to take a stance that, is, that you choose, the player chooses, 
best players in the world, they should they should be able to choose. But if they don't choose and then commit, I'm at their backs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then you get to the green and you have rolling, moving greens. I mean, some of the balls if you watch the U.S. Open, they're spinning all over the place. And what happened? Well. As you know, the, the, in the back nine of the, uh, the Sunday afternoon, we had a real hunt. Um, we had the best players in the world in a hunt, and everything happened. And that's the nature of the championship. All the players want, the spectators want, and I want, and, and the USJ want, want. It was a tremendously successful championship for all those reasons. But the Omega was decided on the last bug, the last group. And it wasn't the one that won it, it was the one that lost it. And that's the cruelty of those as well. So there's, you know, Glory, there's uh, glory and cruelty in golf, and uh, you just have to play to find out which one. Where the golf gods uh, bless you. One of the things that's frustrating for me and a lot of other people is how slow golf is. Uh, what are some ways that you think could speed up the play of golf and make it less, you know, more enjoyable? Maybe? Well, as I mentioned in, in the talk, we're doing that. Poppy Hills is an example where we have removed all the rough. We popped the hills of Poppy Hills. We've widened the fairways, made the ground much more firm and fast. As you get older, you don't have the ball as far. You can't compress the ball as much. So you want the ball to run on the ground. Giving people options, um, taking out some of the penalty hazard. Pete Guy is a penal architect. That I mean, if you play down in, on the railroad ties, you have to play sideways. I'm a, I'm a strategic architect. And then if you go in a hazard, there's a way to advance the ball and keep moving. Um, so that's one of that. So from a purely point of view of design, there's a lot of metrics we, we deal with, it's statistics that people give us on speed of Okay, and you mentioned, uh, what, what's happening now? What are the young millennials doing in golf design? What's the, <laughs> the new hot stuff? Well, they're all doing, they're all, they're all doing uh, different things if they can get the jobs. That's not been easy um, since 2008. But one of the young millennials is here, Patrick. Um, from Luxembourg, and he's doing something very interesting called All Square, which we uh, all have talked to him. Uh, and and it's, he's been working here in Silicon Valley and in Europe to rationalize the access to golf and have it affect the social chatter of golfers <coughs> and give them the information they need. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Right. And it's all, it's, it's a new way. It's, the club is no longer the club of our parents, the social club. It's a world club, and he's bringing all the players together. It's, it's a major club for the day. Okay, we have a few more questions. These are audience questions. Will the U.S. Open come back to Chambers Bay? Uh, I'm, uh, I don't want to, you know, if they do promise this moment, but I, I, don't, I don't want to say yes or no, but I would say as a betting man, you can bet that that's a highly likely uh, situation. Why? Uh, the championship is very successful from all points of view, except perhaps a little bit of agronomy, minor issues with Mother Nature's uh, way of reminding us we're not in charge. <laughs> um, and uh, the, uh, it was economically successful. The people of the Northwest supported it. The USGA was happy with the result of the great competition. Um, and most importantly, they had prepared not only the course itself for the championship, but outside, outside the ropes. They know where the media should go. They know where the tents should go. And, and, and it has all the elements that you need for a championship venue, like a stadium. When you build a new stadium, such as the Levi Stadium, people will you know, go to it. And uh, that's what they did. They built a stadium golf course. And so I think they will have it. They will probably, the USJ um, tends to be loyal to those people who have been loyal to it. And if they had a successful championship on public golf course at, at Beige Black, they went back. And they're going to go back to Torrey Pines. And why not change this Okay. How much has technology impacted the way you design? How important was the knowledge you learned in the field with your father versus what you learned in college? Well, I, the second question I'll take later, but I reference that in some of this. I, I, I have a very liberal arts education at the highest level. I was very privileged. Um, and uh, it was another era. And um, I wasn't into, I, you know, I, I almost <laughs> flunked theory of numbers. So I, I probably couldn't survive this, so it's undoubted. But anyway, um, the, uh, sorry, what was the first question? The first is, how much has technology impacted okay. right. the way well, you design? Okay. So the technical aspects, the science of the course, of course we take that into account. Uh, with the advance of perimeter weighted clubs by paying with, uh, with putters, which are also perimeter weighted, and the use of certain materials that, are, that you can feel the shots better. 
Um, the, 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 it's always been an advance from the days of the gutta percha ball, the aerodynamics of the ball, the dimple patterns, um, all these things add to the together with the athleticism of the young players, both men and women. The Koreans are hitting the ball farther than I hit it. The Korean women are hitting farther than I hit it when I played nationally. So they, they are uh, superb young athletes using the equipment given to them. All right? So we have to think of new defenses. It's not like an Olympic swimming pool which is measured precisely 25 meters or a tennis court or a football soccer field. It has precise dimensions of golf course. It's unique. Each one is different. The course itself is mutable. So we and the defense can alter the design. I want them to be fair challenges, but I want the course to yield to only good thinking and great shot making at the championship level. At the everyday level, I want it to be fun. You know, pay your money, go play, have fun, have a beer. So you know, you touched upon something. Just curious, since you played with Nick Laus and, and you've really been through the history of golf, what for you personally was the biggest equipment change that 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 you saw? Wow, you said wow when you when. Um, well, it, it preceded when I played, but the change from the wooden shaft to the steel shaft to the um, uh, hybrid shafts now, um, uh, I think it made a big difference. The change of the niblet. Bunkers used to be fierce penalties mm -hmm. because you had a, a, a niblet, which was a, a, a blade and a sharp edge, and you had to clip the ball out of the bunker. Very difficult shot. So when Sarazen added the flange on the bottom of it in 35, 1935, it made what we now call a sandwich. The bunkers lost their fierce, and fierce penalty stroke when we added water in the give and take of defenses. That was my father's time. So that was that era. In my era, it's sort of been an accretion. The young players are hitting the ball now. We used to measure the distances and set the bunkers and the fairways according to it. We were about 250 to 265 yards off the tee in the Hogan and Sneed era and uh, later in, in, uh, in the early days of Palmer and Nicholas. And now 300 to 325 yards. So we cannot defend against anything. I've given up <laughs> trying to set up that. So what I've done is going the other way. I'm seducing them to their own demise by giving them all the room in the world and let them have at it. The problem mm -hmm. is if you get on the wrong side of the fairway, I'm going to set the green so that you have a much more difficult shot. There's an equity in the, in the total the, the total hole that, that requires thought and discipline. It's not how far you drive the ball. It's drive and control. Distance uh, this question, uh, so I'll read it. Thank you for what you've done for golf and fantastic work in the redesign of Poppy Hills. Uh, we already asked the next question, but there was a compliment. Thank you. Uh, with golf ball and club technology continuing to increase, but global concerns growing regarding climate change and water conservation, how will the future of golf adapt in terms of drought resistance uh, species, recycled water irrigation, shorter, more technical layouts, or what even Jack, now Jack Nicklaus has suggested in controlled flight golf balls? Well, I could give an essay answer to that, but we wouldn't be here too long. So, uh, we have been, as I mentioned, I had the privilege of being serving on the State Parks Commission, one by Jerry Brown in 1979-83. I think in part that's why um, we were able to help the Spanish Bay get through this uh, approvals process. Um, we have been always concerned with the environment. First of all, if anybody, Alice McKenzie was, quote, probably a conservationist, he used to worry about his era. We, we work with the land, we're farmers. We, we, we know how things, we know the cycles of nature. And we have to work with nature always wants. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I think conservation or, or proper use, I, I referenced it in the talk, is, is a given. And, and if there are many people like uh, Dr. Hertz and the color of on that same path, it's not from a science point of view. But it has to be integrated with the sport itself to be fun. And, and there's an interesting point that I think of, um, I think of, uh, let's say the bald eagle, our national symbol, as having two wings, one ecologic and one economic. You need both wings for, for the body to, to really fly, the bird to fly. And um, I think if you're frugal with your use of pesticides, herbicides, water, it's, you're going to have you know, less cost, and therefore you can lower your green speed, so you want economically and ecologically, and that's changes that. Thank you. How much of what you do is pre-planned, as in, do you have a layout designed beforehand, 
or do you build your courses around the land that's available? I think I already touched on that for site-specific architects. We let the land speak to us. If you go to um, Florence and you walk in to where the great Michelangelo statue of David is, there are some really interesting statues as you enter the hall where and Michelangelo spoke to this in his writings. And, and, uh, he said, I'm, 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 I am revealing the figure in the marble. The marble is, has its own veins, its own soul. But I am revealing the figure within it. And that's the way we think. We are, taught, we are informed by the great masters of sculpture. Sculptures, uh, uh, we let the land speak to us and adopt the game to it. Okay, I think we have a couple more. Um, what was your worst moment in golf design? And what was, you, you choose either the greatest <laughs> advice your father gave you or the worst criticism he gave you? Well, um, Constructive criticism, I, I uh, actually welcome. I'm, I, I believe in the Socratic method to test things by, by argument or by um, uh, test assumptions by discussion. I welcome people who will tell me that, that uh, I could do better. Um, I reject personal criticism. So the worst moment I had maybe was when Gary Player last day at the U.S. Open said to uh, the press that the course had been laid out by a, uh, uh, an architect with one leg shorter than the other. So I immediately caught a hold of Jim Maloney, my doctor, who put in my new hip and said, did you screw up? He said, no, but Gary needs to see an ophthalmologist pretty soon. So, so, so I rejected that. I, I, I tried to make light of it and, and did, but that was unnecessary. In terms of um, constructive criticism, my father would tell me when he, when, as, a, as a teacher when I was, quote, wrong, and uh, why. And um, we would discuss it, uh, sometimes quite emotionally. Um, I wanted a tree left, he didn't want a tree, the tree is gone, you know, well, so now the tree is there. So, <laughs> so things change. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a give and take process, and uh, you know, I'm still learning, and I hope I will be able to also be a teacher to the younger people, and the teacher is the learner. On that last note, uh, so our final question, what advice would, give, would you give to the students about um, starting a business or, or even related to your business? Uh. Well, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, an, an interesting era. If I can divert a little bit and talk about our own society, our nation. Um, I, I was um, in my public life to follow John Kennedy's admissions uh, and the uh, uh, I was elected on the California slate to the Democratic in 1968 on the Robert Kennedy slate the night he was assassinated. Um, I was at Chicago. I was in the, in, in the park and in the convention. Um, I'm very concerned that, we, that I feel in our country right now, the essence of 1968, with a lot of concern that we are stuck at all levels of society. I even think the richest people are stuck. They don't know what to do. And uh, so, and the poorest people are obviously stuck. That's the great middle class that is rising up and, and angry. And my feeling is that we have to um, tell them that they keep working. There is a method where they can get unstuck. The, the American dream is alive. We, we, we need to have all of us keep saying that and not pander to basis emotions in our society. And uh, so I think that the, what I, the advice I would give, in, involve yourself uh, in your own community. Whatever uh, profession you take up, whatever you do with your life, whatever you do with your family life, get on a school board. Um, whatever you, you do, give back to your society and the society itself. Thank you very much for coming.